All right. Yeah, I know I said I'd get the exams graded, but uh, yeah, it didn't happen. I can tell you this though, I um, I pretty much desperately need to get them graded um, soon because I now have a stack of concrete exams on my desk as well. So I really got to start chipping away at those. So I will I will work on it. Okay. Um, first off, before we go back into the wonderful world of uh, beams, y'all have a homework due. You have a homework due on columns. It is due on Monday. So um, I am curious if you have started it. Now, I have been putting this on the slide every day. So, in all seriousness, everybody, come on now. In seriousness, are there any questions about the homework? <laughs> You're going to have fun with the final, I'm just saying. <laughs> That final is going to be um, intense. What? It is. I told you that the hardest test in here was the final. So I can't really get about that though. It is what it is. So <laughs> see, no. <laughs> <laughs> you said that's pretty persuasive. All right, all right, all right. Settle down, settle down. Okay, so just so everybody is aware of what we're doing today and what we're doing on Monday, okay, since, since I, I feel like we, we need uh, uh, pre-warning or uh, uh, advance notice of the calculus coming, there is going to be some calculus potentially today definitely on Monday, so brace yourself. <laughs> this is steel design, right? This is the right class. <laughs> I'm not wearing the hat. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Okay, so let's go back to, um, uh, to basics. Um, we've been talking about continuously braced beams. So remember, the big picture of beam design is that there's two cases that we're going to be considering, a continuously braced beam and a discreetly braced beam. So the continuously braced beam scenario is when L sub B equals zero. Then we have a discreetly braced beam scenario uh, where LB is greater than zero, and we have to consider buckling. And so the buckling, in order to explain where a lot of those equations come from, that's where the calculus comes in. And so there's going to be some calculus. There's going to be a review and an overview of some stuff from 216 that you kind of need to be aware of, and uh, uh, we'll get into that later. But for now, continuously braced beam design, we've heavily explored, I think, Table 3.2. It's a very vital aid. Again, if you haven't tabbed it now, you kind of need to. Um, we talked about deflections and how the limits are pretty much just specified. You know, they're, they're uh, listed in the... Um, uh, in, in either uh, various design guides or listed in the, the documents from your client. Ultimately, your client's going to specify uh, how that's going to work. Um, and then we also discussed, well, if you have a deflection limit, uh, how would you design by deflection? So we did this example. Um, one thing that we did not finish this example with was the local buckling check. We didn't have time to finish it last time. And instead of breaking out uh, a, a big you know, set of calcs. This is a really short calc. So I want you all to remind me real quick. What was BF over 2TF for this problem? And what was H over TW for this problem? 6.28 and what? 51.6. Okay. Now, I want everybody to turn to 16.1-18. Actually, uh, yeah, 16.1-18. Okay. Sixteen point one dash eighteen. Now, 
You should see some tables that look pretty familiar. We've looked at these tables in the past for local buckling for columns. Now, if you look one page uh, previous to 16.1-17, you'll see the one for columns. Now, the thing that's different is that columns basically just have one limit, uh, limiting lambda value, whereas for beams, there are two. You should see a column of lambda sub p values and a lambda sub r values, okay? The long story short uh, is this. If your slenderness is less than lambda p, you don't have to consider local buckling at all. If it's bigger than lambda p, you do, and the question is whether or not your uh, uh, elements are going to buckle in a non-compact fashion or a slender fashion. So really, for, for our purposes in this course, and really not just in this course, but in steel design overall, we pretty much always desire that we're less than this lambda sub p value. So help me out, what is the lambda sub p f that we're going to need, and what is the lambda sub p w that we're going to need? Which case are we going to consider, and what's our equation going to be? Just so you're aware, the lambda sub p f is going to come from the table on the left, and the table on the right is going to be the pw. Remember, what, what kind of section are we looking at? Are we looking at a, an angle, a channel? Everybody with me with what I'm looking at? So what, what would be our lambda sub p value for the flange? There we go, yeah. See, remember for columns, we had a lambda RF, and it was 0 0.56 square root of E over FY. And then we had a lambda sub RW, it was 1.49 square root of E over FY. So that was for columns. And then for beams, it's, they're, they're just going to be different limits. Just because the stresses are different, you're not taking a column, you're not taking a beam and doing this, you're taking it and doing this. So, so just the, stress, the, the limits are different. So we have a lambda PF of 0 0.38. For local buckling, for like, remember, remember what local buckling is. It's the flanges and the webs buckling before the whole thing does, right? So we have lambda PF for the flange buckling and lambda PW for the web buckling. And what's that? Somebody else. Somebody over here. Somebody over here. So, Anybody with me? What's that? Well, no, 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 no. That's, that's, the, that's the same. That's for the flange. There we go, 3.76. And so these are your limits for beams. And remember, remember what this is preventing, again, just to ensure that local buckling doesn't occur. By and large, for buildings, never really an issue, but for bridges, it can be a big issue. So this is 3.76. And can somebody tell me what these values are going to be? I mean, can you chug that out pretty quickly? What is 0.38 square root of E over FY? Remember, we're looking at A992 steel, so what's FY? 50. And what's E? 29,000. Nine point one five. And what about this one over here? All right, is everybody okay with this? So what does this mean? Are we going to have to consider local buckling? Is that going to be an issue? Remember, these are slenderness checks, right? So this is our limit, and this is what we actually have. This is our limit, this is what we actually have. Are we good or not? What's that? Well, one's for the flange, one's for the web. Yeah. Are we good? We are good, okay? Is, is everybody with me on that? I feel like there's a few people who are like, Dr. Mike, we don't even know what you're doing right now. I mean, you gotta, you gotta speak up. Are we good? Okay, all right, so we're good. So, 
our slenderness is less than the limit for, for the flange and the whip. Okay, all right. Enough with that, let's get into design mode. Okay, so what we're gonna be doing for design is, I, I don't think anything that's of great surprise. We're going to be um, you know, determining the moment. We're gonna determine a required ZX. That probably isn't a super necessary step if you're um, uh, dealing with grade 50 steel, but um, if you're not dealing with grade 50 steel, I, I just think it's a good idea to go ahead and do that anyways to just compute your ZX value. Look up the section based on moment requirements, but remember, we're probably going to need to update the loads. Well, we might need to update the loads. Remember, we might make an assumption about the self-weight that may or may not be uh, uh, appropriate. We'll also need to check shear and deflection requirements, and so that might govern. Uh, it might not. We'll see. Okay. Enough talking, let's get into some, uh, to some design. So this is a continuously braced beam design problem. All right, so what we have is a beam that is subjected to 400 pounds per foot, and that does not include the beam self weight and 800 pounds per foot of live load. The beam itself is 60 feet long, and so we're gonna do this problem for two cases. And so what I mean by that is we're doing two different beam design problems. One of them, we're not going to care about deflection at all. And the other one, we're going to assume that we have a, uh, a live load deflection limit of L over 500. And so you're really going to want to pay attention to how I handle that and to how I handle the units and whatnot. Just make sure that you're, you're squared away. Okay. All right. So, first off, let's uh, let's do our analysis. And I'm going to do the analysis based on the moments. So we have a dead load of was it 400 pounds per foot, and a live load of what? 800. Now, for the dead load, one of the things that it said was that there is dead weight on the beam, but it's not included here. So that means that this 400 pounds per foot does not include the beam self-weight, but all beams must withstand their own dead load. So there's a couple ways that you can go about this. You can just pick a value out of the clear blue sky, uh, which is actually what I'm going to do here, or you can just not assume a beam weight at all, but you are going to have to go back and check your, uh, your beam's capacity, because if you don't assume a self-weight, uh, you're going to have to go back and check that whatever beam that you pick is good enough, and if not, you're going to have to pick the next, uh, the next section. What I'm going to do is this. I'm going to assume the beam weighs 100 pounds per foot, or 0 0.1 kip per foot. Why did I pick that value? Seemed reasonable. And, and, and in all seriousness, I have no problem if you just say, I'm just going to use 100 pounds per foot. Um, and it's a pretty round, even figure for, for most beam designs. Most beam designs that we'll be dealing with are, are within this range anyways. Again, it is a perfectly valid design process here to not assume a beam weight at all, but when you pick your section, you're going to have to update your moments uh, to ensure that it's uh, uh, accounting for that. So, therefore, we have a W sub U that's 1.2 times W naught plus W D plus 1.6 W sub L so that's 1.2 times 0 0.5 kips per foot plus 1.6 times 0 0.8 kips per foot. And so what does this come out to be?
1.88 kips per foot. Um, do I have a second on that? And what's our MU? Um, that's a good question. Was it simply supported? Yeah, so if it's a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load, it is what? There we go. How long was this beam? Okay. So what does that come out to be? 846. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, let's compute a required ZX. I just want you to get into that habit in case FY is not 50 KSI. So we're gonna, like I said, we're going to do this problem twice, okay? So we'll say design one. No deflection limits. So MU is 846 foot kips. Now, I'm going to go ahead and convert that to inch kips, and what does that come out to be? 10, What's FY for this problem? 50. Right? So, VMN has to be greater than or equal to MU, and VMN in this case is 0 0.9 FY ZX because LB is zero. So therefore, ZX minimum is MU over 0 0.9 FY. And so that is 0 0.9 times 50 KSI over 10,152 inch kips. And so what does that come out to be? 1, it was it specified in the problem? Oh. Okay, that's a good point. Apologies. That is, we will say, 0.12 mistakes. So, that was supposed to be specified. I apologize. However, here, here I will say this. Even if the steel was not specified, we are dealing with W shapes. Remember, if you go to table 2-4, what is the preferred material spec for W shapes? It's A992, so it's a fairly reasonable assumption. Okay. What does this come out to be? Say it again. Oh. Inches to the third, right? Okay. Now help me out. If your ZX requirement is 225.6, inches to the third, what section would you pick? So, you're saying try W27 by 84 based on a ZX value of what? All right. Bless you. Does that sound good? Now, here's the thing. What can you tell me about the beam self-weight? It doesn't match what we assumed. What else? The, we assumed greater, so we're good. But 
there's also something to be said about let, let's let's look at this for a second let's go to the ZX table for those of you that have your AISC 15th edition steel construction manual with them I'm in table 3-2 oh you're way way ahead you had, do you have 3-2 tabbed All right, three dash, what, what am I on, 20, 20, well, 24, yeah, 24. What was the ZX value that we computed, 225.6? Well, what's going on with the 24 by 84? It's 224. We probably could have picked that section if we were better on our moments, right? You know what I mean? Like, we overestimated the moments. If we were to go back and update the moments, we could probably use that section. Now, these two sections weigh the same amount, so there's no issue on weights. But what is there an issue on? Like, why would I use the 24 by 84 as opposed to the 27? Well, if you're paying per pound, the cost wouldn't matter. But what, who would be happy? The architect would be happy. And why would the architect be happy? Because it's smaller. Because it's shallower. So there is value in updating this. Let's update. So this is your iteration. So let's update the load. Your architect represents your client. Your client's the one who's paying you. So I like money. So I like not getting fired. Update the load. So what is your new you? So this value right here is not 0.1, it's 0.084. So what does this come out to be? Can somebody calculate that for me? One point eight six. So a little smaller. What's your MU? Eight hundred forty-seven. Well, how heavy is the beam? Eighty-four pounds per foot, or point zero eight four kips per foot. That's a good question. All right, and so what's my required ZX? It's MU over 0 0.9 FY. What does that come out to be? Well, yeah, you'll need to convert this to inch kips, but just multiply that by 12. Two 23.3 inches to the third. So could we use the 24 by 84? Yeah, we could use the 24 by 84. So is the answer the 27 by 84? No, it's not. For this design, I argue that the answer is use a W24 by 84 because the ZX is 224. Any questions on that? Does that make any sense? Okay. Now, let's go to part two. What's part two saying? Deflection. Oh, oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, hold on, hold, hold on. I'm very, I'm very, 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 very sorry. Very, we got one more thing we got to check. I'm sorry. What do we have to check? What did I forget? And I'm not worried about, well, Deflection's not for this for this design because we're not considering deflection limits. What are what did we forget? Shear. So let's compute the shear. So the shear is W 
L over 2, and so what is that? It's, all, it's really easy to forget shear given the, the, the magnitudes here. What is the shear load? Not the capacity, the load. What are we getting for a value? 55.8. What's the shear capacity of a W24 by 84? 300 and some, right? So it's, it's not even close. So you said 55.8, but FVN was 340. So it, I mean, come on. It's easy to forget shear. So I think that concrete design exam, they all had all those shear problems. And in here, it's just, it's an afterthought. It's crazy, isn't it? OK, now design two. Now, design two, here's the thing with design two. We have to meet moment demand. We have to meet shear demand. But we also have a deflection limit. What is our limit for deflection? L over 500. Now, what is our actual deflection? Like, if we're computing deflection, how do you compute deflection for this beam? Well, I mean, it'll be in inches, but I'm asking, <laughs> I'm asking if you have a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load, what is the deflection? Oh, some. You all have your manual. There we go. So the live load deflection is 5L to the fourth over 384 EI. And The maximum deflection is L over 500. Okay? Now, if I'm in design mode, what do I need to know? Like, what am I solving for here? The I value. I know the loads. I know the length. I know the E, I need to solve for the I value. And so the way that I'm going to do that is this. I'm going to say, and we're going to have to do a little bit of algebra here, I'm going to say that the live load deflection needs to be less than or equal to the maximum. Or 5WL to the fourth over 384EI. Maybe I should put the subscript there. And I should put my IX there. That needs to be less than or equal to L over 500. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip and multiply. So I'm going to multiply both sides by IX, multiply both sides by IX, and then at the same token, multiply both sides by 500 over L, multiply both sides by 500 over L. So on the right side, the fractions cancel, and I'm just left with IX. And on the left side, what happens? Well, the IXs cancel. That cancels, and that cancels. And then uh, what do I get? I get 2,500 WL to the third over 384E. Did I do that right? Did I go too fast or? Algebra helps. Sound good? Now, here's the thing. I find that it's pretty easy when doing these problems. If you just convert everything to a base unit system, it's a little different than how we've done deflections in the past. But I just find it to be kind of easier. See, E is 29,000 KSI. What is the length? 60 feet, just call it 720 inches. And what is W? It's 0 0.8 kips per foot. Just say it's 0 0.8 over 12 kips per inch. Just do that. Makes it a lot easier. So therefore, 
the minimum IX, 2500, Seven hundred twenty What does that come out to be? Say it again. Fifty five eighty six point two. What? inches to the fourth. Now what did we pick for case one? What was our answer? The W24 by 84, would it work? No, why not? It's too small. What's, what's the moment of inertia of a 24 by 84? So note So let me ask you this, for this design, what governs the design? Is it the moments or the deflections? What's the driving force behind what beam we're going to pick? The deflections, okay? So we're going to find that this beam probably has phenomenal shear or phenomenal moment capacity. It's going to have phenomenal shear capacity, but it's really going to be governed by the deflections. Now how do we pick a shape based on its moment of inertia? We go to table 3.3. Three. Table 3.2 is listing the shapes based off of ZX. Now, if you have your AISC 15th edition steel construction manual with you, you will know to look it up based, or it's a few pages afterwards. So I'm on 16 point, or not 16 point, I'm sorry. I'm on 3-28. It's a really easy table to miss because it's only two pages, but it's a really important one. All right. So if we have a requirement of this IX, what section would you pick? The W33 by 118. So we'll say try a W33 by 118. IX is what? 5900. Now, this beam is heavier than our assumption and whatnot, so we do need to go through the process of checking the moment capacity. So what's ZX for a W33 by 118? And you know what that means? You're going to have to go back to table 3-2. And I apologize, but that's just sort of the nature of beam design that you have to flip back and forth between tables. I, because you have to flip back and forth and back and forth. I, no. I, I'm, but I'm considerate. That's a fair point. That's a fair point. Say it again. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Is that right? Okay. So help me out. For this section, what is phi mn? 0.9 fy zx. So 0 0.9 50 ksi. 415. So what does that come out to be? What? So convert that to foot kips. Sound good? 
We do have to update our loads, so we have W sub U, 1.2 W naught plus WD plus 1.6 W sub L. Why are we updating our loads? Because this needs to be 0 0.118 kit per foot. Say it again. So 1.902, 902. Sound good? Yes, sir. Sorry. Oh, you could have. You could have. Um, I'm just. I'm just trying to make sure that you're fine with this expression. Um, there might be some reasons because of the homework. So I just want to make sure that you're, you're familiar with that. Homework and, I don't know, some celebrations. Because what if, what if it wasn't an I-beam? You know what I mean? I'm just, yeah. Now, did I? Or maybe it's misdirection. Now, let me say this, Mr. Elliott, we are going to use the table to look up phi VN for now. So, can somebody give me the MU and the VU? What's the MU? 855.9. What about the VU? And what about the VVN? That's a lookup. Yes. Yes. And what is it? Oh, 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 no, I'm, I'm sorry. What about the Phoebe in there? 489. 489. So again, the same story, just a phenomenal amount of shear capacity. And we have a phenomenal amount of moment capacity too. Like this is way bigger than that, this is way bigger than that. The reason why they're so much bigger is because this beam has a very stringent um, deflection limit on it. Very stringent. So, are there any questions on this? Okay, him then him. Him. Uh, is deflection always a governing case in the beam? No, it depends. It could be, or not. What about slenderness? We could check slenderness for each of these, and um, here here's the thing. I'll let you do that, but I can tell you it's not it's not going to be an issue for these. Um, wait, what? What am I missing? What are you talking about? Yeah. Are long or too long? Yeah. No, no, no. Remember, slenderness is BF over 2TF. We're talking, we're talking about the local slenderness, the, the flanges and the webs. Okay, so we're not looking at the entire Not yet. That's coming, like, next. Remember, we're assuming that it's fully braced, so it, the distance between braces right now is zero. That's coming next. Okay, okay you then you, yes. Did we miss one? Hold on, say that again. It's, heavy, it's heavier. Yeah, you use the bolt section because that's the lightest one of that group. Same thing with the ZX table. That hold on. I was just gonna ask, so are these are assuming the simplest support to be one of the 
Well, the, 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 the values in, in 3.2 don't care what the, the analysis, that's just the capacity. The, this, the WL squared over 8, that, this right here is what assumes simply supported, but this doesn't care what the load on the beam is. You had a question. What do you mean? That, yes, well, yes and no, okay? And that'll, I, I will be better at answering that in the next few days because I, we kind of have to discuss discreetly braced beam design first. Let me give you a short answer. The beam is going to be discreetly braced when you pour the wet concrete on it, but once the concrete cures and you have a composite beam, it's a different story. See what I mean? So, was there a question over here? Was that it? Okay, all right. So, let me see what time it is. How much time? Ooh, we got time. Cool. I like it. Every time you win what? Uh, is there ever a time that you wouldn't use the bolded ones? Um, let me say, okay, not really. When you're looking at discreetly braced beams, and I'm, I, it's, I can't really answer it right now because we need to get into the math, but it's possible that the economical section that's discreetly braced might not be a bolded row. Okay. The other two answers I can think of is one, just on availability. If that product isn't available, maybe use one that's more available. And two, um, what's that? Depth requirements, yes. That's th that, that that's the only reasons I could say that you wouldn't use a bolded row. But you are gonna you are possibly gonna be referring to non bolded rows, but that's gonna become clear later. So okay. Are there any questions before I talk about torsion? Okay. First off, so everything that I've been doing up until now assumes that L B equals zero. Okay? Now, let's start talking about what happens when LB does not equal zero. And what happens when LB does not equal zero is that beams want to buckle. Okay? Now, specifically, the way that a beam buckles, typically, is it wants to kick out and twist. Okay? And it looks something like this. So here's a beam, and when you bend it, it kind of wants to kick out and go like this. Okay? So we call it lateral torsional buckling because it whoop, kicks out and twists, okay? So the torsion part begs some review of deformables. Now I have some images here of some steel beams to kind of show you what it looks like. This is an eye, a cantilevered eye beam that's under, you know, a point load at the end and you can see it. It's really easy to see how that beam has kicked over and twisted. This is a beam uh, uh, that's being tested by a guy named Carl Barth. He was my PhD advisor at WVU. Uh, and you can see he was trying to, in his work, he was trying to push the envelope on how much uh, inelastic capacity you can get out of a beam. And so this failure mechanism is kind of interesting because not only has it kicked over and twisted, but you can see the flange has locally buckled as well. What happens when you uh, load a beam uh, in this fashion, you're loading it until failure, essentially you get both uh, L, uh, both buckling modes, like you get local and global buckling, it's just a matter of which one happens first. Like this is this is pushing this beam to the max. I mean, this is this is taking that beam almost down to the floor. So this was a, a pretty intense test. Now, I want to talk about torsion, and we're going to take it back to Engineering 216. And don't worry, it'll be okay. Now. I want to explain what, what's going on here because I think it, it, it takes some time. And I'm really going to take my time with this derivation because I'm, I'm just going to prepare you and you just have to get used to it. There is some calculus in this. There's a lot of equations. Just we'll take our time with it, but brace yourself. Okay, so what we're talking about in, uh, in torsion 
is something like this. You have a shaft, let's say that's, you know, fixed on this end, you know, it's got a fixed support, and you're applying some torque to it, okay? And one of the things that you're trying to determine is if I take this thing and I twist it like so, you know, here's the center of that shaft, and that might be, you know, where it was initially, initially but after you apply that torque, you'd agree that it's going to rotate some amount. Would you agree with that? Okay. Now, that rotation, you can compute that, and that rotation is defined as TL over GJ. Okay? Now, that's T. L is just how long it is, right? Now, G, G is a material property. It's like E. Like E is the Young's modulus. This is the shear modulus. This is, for, for uh, circular shafts, was the polar moment of inertia, but I'm not going to call it that. I'm going to call it the torsion constant. So the analogy is you can kind of think of this like your moment of inertia for uh, beam and bending. Okay? Now, a couple things. First off, this formula only works if the torsion is constant. If it's not constant, okay, really what you're after is you're after something like this. Basically, the only thing that you can define is that the rate of twist is the torsion over gj. And if this uh, torsion is constant, then all you would do is just integrate. And since you're integrating a constant, that's how you get that length there. But if it's not constant, then you're going to have to define it in this fashion. So if you want to write it in terms of a differential equation, you could say that uh, phi prime is T over GJ. Okay? Okay? And so when I say differential equations, this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Okay? Now, there is one thing that we're not talking about here, uh, and it's something you really sort of gloss over in Engineering 216. I can pretty much guarantee you, regardless who taught you 216 and what you did, every single problem that you did with torsion assumed that the shape was round, that it was a circular cross-section. There is a reason that uh, uh, if you look at uh, shafts in machines or the camshaft in your transmission or what have you, there is a reason why they're always round, they're always circular, either a shaft or a pipe, okay? The reason is that when you twist a shaft that is circular, okay? When you twist a shaft that's circular, it doesn't warp. In other words, if I have, where did I put my marker? Okay. If I look at this shaft, you know, up and down, so here's the shaft, and it's fixed down below, and here's that, and I apply a torque to it, it doesn't move up and down. Like if it's here, once I twist it, it stays flat. Okay? I-beams don't do that. And I'll show you that on Monday, but I-beams don't do that. They actually go in and out of the plane a little bit. Everybody's packed. We still got a couple minutes. So, um, we got a couple minutes. So, here's the thing. For a rounded circular shaft, we could say that the moment is defined as gj times phi prime. And if the shaft is round, that's perfectly fine. But I-beams aren't round. They're I-beams, right? So I propose that there's some more stuff that we need to add to this differential equation. Now, we'll talk about this later, but essentially it's going to be another constant, and I know the math gets nasty, but it's a third derivative, okay? Don't worry, the, calc the actual Diffie Q stuff is actually kind of easy. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. This we call St. Venant. This we call warping. Again, we're going to see a lot of calculus on Monday, so be ready for it. That's all I have.
We'll see you on Monday.